Kids, uh, you've warmed the cockles of our hearts, hey? And uh, we love to have our children and our grandchildren. I've got six of them at the moment, and I've only had two out of the four married, so I've ordered 12. <laughs> and um, I tell you, becoming a dad, becoming a mum, and a granddad and a grandma, I think that uh, for me, the purest expression of, of love would have to be the kind of love that a, a father, a mother has for their child. And when my firstborn, Stephanie, uh, came into this world, she didn't want to come in. She was like two or three weeks late and uh, we had a lot of medical trouble and, and uh, you know, oxygen levels down, placenta dying and all that stuff back in 1980. It was, it was a tough time. Kathy went through, it was an extremely difficult uh, birth and a lot of anxiety. And, but you know, when that little baby was born, it was like something transformed in our hearts. You know, the, the pain, the difficulty kind of put aside. And, and for me, I know the very first act for me was just to grab this little girl and just to thank God and I didn't care who, who was listening I was praying in my spiritual prayer language, giving praise to God and in those first few days, first few weeks I think I caught a glimpse of what the Father feels when He looks at us, when He looks at you, how He feels for people I mean I read it in the Bible that God loves us that God cares for us. And I kind of had experienced it in my life. But for many people, it's more a concept. And, uh, but when you actually become a dad and become a mum, you, you feel it. It's better felt than taught. And something transforms within our lives where we kind of understand the amazing love that God has for us. And, uh, you know, we would give our lives for our kids. We wouldn't even blink. I think a natural dad, a natural mum, if there was a choice, my child's life or me, take me. What is that? That's beyond rationality. I think they're little glimpses of God saying, I'm real. I made you to reflect my heartbeat and the feelings that you have for your children, you being prepared to sacrifice your life, that's the kind of feeling I have for you. And I actually did sacrifice the life of my son so that you could be restored back to me and the terrible barrier of sin and living independently of me has been removed by my son coming to earth and dying in your place for your sins and rising again. Um, for the last couple of days, have, uh, I'm just was reflecting this morning, the last couple of days have been really good for me. I'm about to head off to Sao Paulo with Cathy. Um, tomorrow, tonight, actually, we're flying out to the World Pentecostal Conference. And as part of my, my duties as head of the CRC, we're, we're constituent members. And, and I just, the last couple of days have been great. I've had really good conversations with my four children. I mean, not just height, but just good conversations. And, uh, and with my six grandchildren, I've been able to, to see them. And we had a, a function Friday night, took a couple of them out for breakfast yesterday morning. And uh, after I thought, I am the most blessed man. Why do I feel so happy? Why do I feel so fulfilled? It's because when you're kind of your kids and your grandkids kind of come to you, and just show affection and there's meaningful talk, you, you just feel awesome. My little grandkids, every time they see me, it's like, they may have seen me yesterday, but it's like they haven't seen me for a year. Oh, bubble, 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 and they come running up and hugs and kisses. And I tell you, it melts me. If they asked me for a million dollars, I'd give it to them straight away, oh. if I had it. I did not realize one of them was in the room. <laughs> okay. That relational joy, folks, that's how God the Father feels when you do that to Him. 
That's what he feels when you do that to him. When you come into his presence like a child and say, Father, I'm here just to spend time with you. See, we can be Christians conceptually, intellectually. Oh, it's all true. It's all valid. It's all right. But God the Father wants us to experience his presence and his love. And when we develop that kind of intimacy, it brings him tremendous satisfaction and joy. The kind of joy that I have felt over the past couple of days quantify that so much more. The Father is not a machine, a heavenly Father. He's not a God out there. He is a person with feelings and heart, and he's chosen to create us free, not as robots. And what a risk he took. And human beings chose, so many chose to go the wrong way. And sin came into the world, and, and, and all the evils that we see is because people live separate to him, independently of him. That's the biggest sin in the world, living independently of God and not receiving his offer of love and forgiveness through his son, Jesus Christ. And all the other sins flow, all the mistakes and the failings and problems and difficulties flow out of that state of being living separately from him. And uh, God the Father, his heart for us is just amazing. He is the greatest giver in all the world. He gave us his one and only son. He gave us his finest, the prince of heaven, to become a human being. And you think about that, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, perfect relationship, perfect fellowship, spirit beings that uh, created the physical, but beyond the physical. But to bring us back to God, to save us from our sins and our mistakes, to reconcile us into a relationship with the Father, the eternal son had to become a man. And, he, and when he went back to heaven, he didn't become a spirit being again. And so Jesus Christ, the eternal, the eternal son became Jesus of Nazareth. And so God in heaven, the son, you know what he looks like? A 33-year-old Palestinian Jew. And he still has great holes in his wrists. He has a great gash on his side. If you take his robe off, you'll see his back is massacred and his front is massacred as they scourged him. You'll see the marks on his head. These marks are there for eternity. The price the Godhead paid is that he couldn't go back to, to, to his previous state. So when we go to heaven, is he will be there. And his scars remind us of God's love. That it's not just a feeling. He actually demonstrated his love. He sent his best to, to be able to forgive us of our sins. Jesus took the punishment and rose again, went back to heaven, and we enjoy personal salvation today, forgiveness of our sins. But you know, he, he wants us not just to say, well, I, I, I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm forgiven. He wants us to develop such intimacy with him, relationship with him. And uh, um, I, I, there are so many wonderful scriptures in the Bible, I guess to me the, the, uh, the one that speaks of the Father's love more than anything would have to be in Luke 15 when Jesus told us the parable of, we call it the lost son or the lost boys, two boys, a younger one and an older one, who were in a lot of trouble, got into a lot of trouble. And the dad is a wonderful dad. And the younger boy, he says, Dad, I, I, I just want to, I want to quit being kind of hanging around you, he goes, can you just give me my inheritance? He takes off and um, he mucks up big time, the son. You can read it in Luke 15. And uh, he, he hurts his dad really badly. And that's the sad thing. Do you know, we have the capacity to hurt our dads and to hurt our heavenly dad. What's the queen that said, wasn't it? Queen Elizabeth, who's a wonderful Christian woman. She said, when you love much, goes, when you love much, you also grieve much. That love, particularly the people that we love the most, the people that we love the most have the power to hurt us the most. It's not strangers that have the power to hurt us the most. It's those who we're closest to. And God so loves us and so cares for us. And he grieves when we hurt him. And this story, this boy, he hurt his dad badly. 
And, and out of hurting his dad, he actually hurts himself. And by being disobedient to his beautiful dad and being disrespectful to him, and what happens is that, that he, he becomes deceived in dishonoring his dad. He, he, self-deception comes in and self-demeaning behaviors occurred and attitudes and self-destruction takes hold of this boy. You read the story and it, it's, it's an, you think this kid it's like he's rejected his dad's love and you see the consequences. It's a story of what happened in, in the beginning in creation. And so, but this kid, he comes to the place where he comes to his senses and he realized how I'm living. And you know, he, he, he changes his mind, he's remorseful and then he's repentant. And we learned a bit about that last week with Carl Face, the difference between remorse and repentance. Remorse because he was in a terrible state, self-defeating, self-demeaning behaviours. He had rejected his dad, he spent all the money. And, um, and so he's remorseful, but then he's repentant. He actually says, you know what, I've done the wrong thing. I, I'm, I've really hurt God and I've hurt my dad. I'm going to go back and I'm going to say sorry. He's going to, those famous nine words, you know, three phrases of three words, going to say, Dad, I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And he says, he's going to say it to God, and he's going to say it to his dad, and he's, and he's not wanting anything back. He's saying, I've blown everything. Just make me one of your hired servants, Dad, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, I need to come back home. And, uh, but here we see, I want to read this scripture to you before I close. It's a wonderful scripture. This is the dad, and this is Jesus speaking, and he's giving us a picture of our heavenly dad, what he thinks of you and me. Kids, what he thinks of you. Even when we do the wrong thing, our heavenly father doesn't whack us. He doesn't reject us. He hurts, but he, he, he so wants to embrace us. This is what it says. When he was still a long way off, the boy coming back, his father saw him, which means the dad, it speaks of the dad expecting the son to come back. He probably was praying, God changed my, my boy's heart. Parents, never give up on your sons and your daughters and your friends. Keep praying for them. Keep praying. Don't let resentment, don't be offended and, uh, by people's sins. Just love them through it. We don't accept sin, but we accept the sinner and we love the sinner because that's what we are. We're sinners saved by the grace and mercy of God. And so there's no room in our hearts for hatred or offense. It's almost incompatible with being a Christian who loves God. But we're to love even the unlovable and even those who hurt us. If we treat them the same way as non-Christians, there was no difference between us and them. But we're the people of life. We're the people of Jesus. We're to be the greatest lovers in the world. And, and, and God's nature is one of giving and forgiving. And we're to reflect that. And so the dad, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, his heart pounding. He ran out. What a heart. And embraced him and kissed him. I mean, that's had our, our father. It's almost like, and the son starts speaking. And he says, Father, and this is what an honest and humble self-appraisal. Father, I've sinned against God. I've sinned against you. He, he understood that his greatest sin was against God. And that's what caused him to sin against his dad and then to sin against his big brother and to sin against himself and other people with his terrible behaviours. And he goes, I, I don't deserve to be called your son ever again. But the father wasn't listening. He's like, what are you talking about? It's like the father, he doesn't want to listen to all your sins. He doesn't want you to confess all your stuff that we do. He just wants to see if our hearts are honest and we say, Lord, I need you. And it's like God doesn't listen to the garbage. He wants our hearts. And when he sees a heart that's not just remorseful, but repentant, and says, I need you, God. I, I, I need to come into alignment with you. He rushes in with forgiving grace. He rushes in with mercy. He rushes in with salvation. And he says, the father wasn't listening. And he was calling to his servant. He's saying, he's saying, he's saying shh, 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 it's fine. But fellas, come quick. This boy was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. And he says this, this is what the father does. Bring a clean set of clothes and dress him. My boy is cleansed of his sins. 
and let's cover him. Put the family ring on his finger to signify his dignity, that he belongs. And sandals on his feet. In other words, let him now be someone who can function in life and give him some good, strong footwear. Then get a grain-fed heifer. He didn't say, go find that scrawny cow down the road that's half dead. He says, bring the best animal. Because I want to have a party. We're going to have a feast. We're going to have a wonderful time. My son is here, given up for dead and now alive, given up for the lost, for lost and now found. And they began to have a wonderful time. I don't think there's any better picture. It's an emotional picture of a dad who doesn't just say, I love you, but is demonstrating his love. God demonstrates his love for us, even that when we were sinners, when we were godless, Christ died for us. Here today, you may not have a personal relationship with this kind of God. You're missing out. He's the greatest person in the universe. He made the heavens and the earth. He revealed himself in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. I met him 45 years ago as a 17-year-old kid. You probably saw the photo of me with my long hair and David Hersey baptizing me. He was my, my mentor, my, my encourager. I met him. I fell in love with him because he called me to understand his love. And he's never done me any wrong, but only blessing and kindness and goodness. It's not a religion. It's about a relationship with him, to talk with him each day and let him talk to you. It's as intimate as, as my relationship with my kids and my grandkids. In fact, it's probably more intimate because I can share with him what I really can't share with my daughters and son and my grandkids, really. There's some things you can't share with any other human being, but you can share it with our Father. You can share it with Jesus Christ because he knows you and he knows you through and through. He knows the dark side, the good side. He knows everything you can't hide. And he says, I said, love you. Stop talking, stop talking. Let me love you. Let me love you. Let me change you. Let me help you. Let me heal you. Let me empower your life. If you haven't experienced Christ as your Savior, I'd like to lead you in a prayer. Even while you're seating there, you can say, Jesus Christ, I'd like to get to know this Father. You can and for all of us here who are believers in Jesus Christ, young and old, God the Father so desires relationship with you. Not just once, I'm a believer. Not just cold, calculated, I'm a Christian. But really emotionally, as emotionally empowering as, and, and feeling oriented as you have for your own children. That warmth that you have for those grandkids and, and, and your children that you'd give your life for. God the Father has feelings like that and he wants intimacy with us. And I want to pray that this Father's Day, if you are just kind of like, well, yeah, I'm a Christian, but yeah, I read my Bible, but it's kind of like God's not speaking to me. I pray, but I don't. I say, seek him, draw close to him, talk with him, Come into his presence. Let his word come alive to you when you read a chapter or two a day of the scriptures and, and let him love you, let him heal you. Come to know him just like Jesus tells us here. And uh, what a wonderful story. A great story. This is the Father's heart. I'd like to pray for you right now. Can we just close?